First, Mel will spend about 15 minutes talking about his early influences and what is inspiring his work. Then he will give a 10 minute tour of his studio. And then we'll end with a 20 minute live demo where you'll really get a sense of his materials, his process and his painting philosophies. During his talk, you can submit questions by clicking on the chat icon button at the bottom of your computer screen. Or if you're on the phone, uh, you click more and then chat. After the demo, there will be a moderated Q&A, but I may be able to throw in a few questions during uh, Mel's presentation as well, so please feel free to enter your questions at any time. So today's talk is part of a series of programming around our current exhibit, exhibit at the Barn Gallery in Woodland, California. Memories of a New Future is a multidisciplinary collaboration between seven artists, including Mel, who came up with the initial idea for the show along with artist and friend, Melissa Chandon. These talented artists all came together to create this conceptual show around the theme of embarkation and the hopes, dreams, and fears of setting off into the unknown. I hope you get a chance to visit this exhibit in person, which runs through November 14th. And we also premiered a video yesterday on the Yellow Arts website and Facebook page uh, which features all of the artists who talk more about the work and the inspiration behind this show. So now I'd like to introduce our featured artist, Mel Smothers. Mel Smothers is an American contemporary artist born in the West Coast of the USA in 1947. He grew up in Northern California and received his BFA from UC Davis and his MFA from the University of Idaho. He evolved as an artist in the pop art America during the 60s and 70s, working alongside his contemporary Andy Warhol and Wayne Thiebaud. Thiebaud would later become Smothers University professor and a forefront figure of American pop art. Smothers is well established in the United States. He was honored with selection by Cooper Union to exhibit in the Emerging Artists of the Year exhibition in New York City in 2006. He has an extensive exhibition history, both nationally and internationally, including public art commissions and solo and group exhibitions in museums, galleries, and private collections from New York, Chicago to San Francisco, and now Woodland, California. So uh, I'm gonna throw it over to Mel now. And how you doing, Mel? I'm doing fine. Thanks for that introduction. That was terrific. <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, let's see. So I'm going to, uh, we're going to go into the studio today. And I'm going to see that. We'll, um, this is where I work. It's over on Lake Tahoe. And this is my studio. Glad you guys could make it. Very happy to have everybody here do a quick panorama of what we got in here. And then if I understand right, we're going to do a PowerPoint presentation on uh, some influences on my work. So I am ready to talk about those influences whenever you're ready. Okay, and here we go. And now, here we go. Well, uh, this is one of those fun things that um, I think any artist uh, would be happy to find. And I, even though I was interested in art my, my whole life, it seems like I was geared toward that. I didn't really realize that. And I was off running around doing a lot of other things. And when I uh, hit my uh, uh, midlife crisis, it, so they say, uh, my mom drug out these paintings from kindergarten. And you can see over on the right hand corner, I, I signed my name, I, I like the full signature of Melvin back then in those days. And uh, I saw these paintings uh, and I, it just originally, I mean, uh, it sent me back to that time, very happy times in my life. And um, 
I thought, you know, I think maybe I'm cut out to be a figurative painter. Uh, this, uh, this then is getting into some influences. Uh, it's a, uh, oh, I can see by the bottom corner, it's a Diebenkorn. So when I, in the 60s, when I started getting interested in art, and I had no education on art at all, but I did find that I uh, visually was interested in art. Uh, the late 60s, there was a lot of, uh, it was the time of the hippies, and we were looking for very creative ways of living other than just falling into a, uh, uh, getting a job and going through life like that. Uh, so I was out uh, enjoying things, and I, I, I stumbled on, uh, what was uh, our work during that time uh, of the, the local artists, and that was Bay Area figurative style. And this is to Richard Diebenkorn. Uh, I'd never seen landscapes portrayed like this. And along with some of the other uh, influences that follow, I began seeing the landscape as these uh, artists were painting it. Uh, this looks like a uh, de Kooning who isn't part of uh, the Bay Area figurative. And, and he actually comes a little later in my influence, but it's because of understanding the Bay Area figurative in those early, uh, early 60s, I don't mean uh, early influences in the late 60s. Uh, he's part of the, that transition into the art today. What else we got? Uh, this looks like um, a close up of an Elmer Bischoff and and I, uh, you can see how thick he put it, this paint on. I, I, I was just amazing. I was very influenced that you could do this. Uh, before, I always thought uh, a good painting was to look like a photograph as close as you could to a photograph. But then, you know, I just didn't have any experience. I just knew that I liked art and I, and I was drawn to art. And now when I see this, a uh, just wonderful study of grays and this, uh, and this is Elmer Bischoff. And the previous landscape was Bischoff. And then this is a Bischoff figurative. Uh, I mean, just as a student, this just was eye popping and, and maybe uh, other students were drawn to something else, but I just said, man, if someday I could ever paint like this, it really spoke to me emotionally that paint can have emotion. Uh, these are all things as a student. I have no idea how Bischoff did this at the time. All I knew, it was like magic that he he could perform this. Oh, and then and then we go on to what I'd call a second generation Bay Area Figurative, and Wayne Tebow, who had the opportunity to study with the uh, Diebenkorn and Bischoff. Here he is. Uh, I I put this into the slides, uh, not so much for the painting aspect like the first two. Uh, but because uh, it gives me something to talk about Wayne. And, and for one thing, uh, over the years, I've been able to acquire a few of his uh, print works, no paintings, but this is a litho uh, that is part of uh, our collection. And it's a, sort of a rare clown. Um, there wasn't too many of them, and that's kind of why I wound up with it. Because early on, when you start collecting, you just try and get whatever you can. You can trade or, or the things that not too many other people wanted. And this was uh, back, I think, in the 60s, too, uh, that it was a small printing run from uh, a press in Oregon. And, and, uh, and it, because of that, I was able to, to find one. But what I want to talk about is with, with Wayne, um, he was a professor I was able to study with. So I came up too late to study with uh, uh, Deben Korn and Bischoff as much as I liked their work. Uh, but also, uh, I had no idea how you studied with a painter. All I knew is that you love, I love painting. And a little story about Wayne is that one of my buddies uh, who was, did go and get an education, was educated, uh, Jim Klotz, an educator, uh, he told me when I was telling him how strong this desire to paint was, uh, but I knew nothing about it, just that I, I liked it, I liked what I saw. Uh, uh, Jim said, look, I've taken classes from Wayne Tebow. You just go to Davis and you can sit in those classes. 
which totally freaked me out. I mean, I was afraid to go on to a, a, a campus in the first place, uh, but then to, to, to go on and pretend I was a student. But uh, that's a, a long story for another day, but eventually what happened is I became uh, uh, Wayne Tebow, and I've had a few very influential professors. Uh, I'm a real advocate for in, in school learning, <laughs> and uh, uh, but Wayne Tebow stood out uh, at at the top of the list, and uh, he was. Uh, I I was very nervous about going in the class and felt I didn't belong there. Uh, he welcomed me. Well, at first I got kicked out, but like I said, it's a long story. But uh, he uh, introduced me to art history, which I knew nothing about, and this uh, long history of painters and. And ultimately, when I when I decided to go ahead and continue my education, uh, he wrote a letter for grad school, and and after being rejected several times over a number of years, um, because he wrote a letter, um, and I got introduced to the fact that you need these kind of things to come up in in the art academia. Uh, I was able to go on to grad school, which I really wanted. I was really hungry for more learning about painting. I wanted to learn everything about painting. So uh, that's where Tebow's influence. Who else we got? So I think I think that's it for now. I think it's time for us to uh, see your studio, Mel. All right, that sounds <laughs> I'm gonna, great. I'm going to stop sharing here. And there okay. We Let's see, I'd, I'd like to get mine on. Okay, and uh, we'll swap this around. So you can have a view of my studio. Here's the, the door we came in. And uh, it's interesting that uh, to me, uh, I've had some great studios in New York City and down in Florida, but this one uh, is my latest. And it's unique too. And what I'm showing you is the uh, where the, the carpenters tore out the wall because when I found this studio, it actually was an apartment. And, uh, and, and this apartment is on uh, Lake Tahoe. Uh, this is the marina out here. And I have an art studio that actually I uh, decide to recommission a raft and I'll have a place to park it. Uh, I took out all the walls. We did all the demolition of uh, it, uh, the fireplace was in here. Uh, of course, the kitchen, bathroom, uh, heating, took everything out of here so I could get enough room to paint. Um, as you paint, it just like any artist, sculptor too, you just kind of keep craving more and more room. So this is what it looks like. Uh, we did get all our approvals, so we are legally in here. And it's a good thing because when I started tearing out the walls, the neighbors were pretty suspicious of maybe I had an underground operation going on here. Uh, and uh, on this, like I say, studio space is precious. I don't have enough room for my artwork. I uh, Long ago, I outgrew uh, studio space where I could keep my. This is my rack where, uh, when I finish paintings, I and I usually roll them up. The art, uh, the oil paintings, are all get rolled up. I after they dry, then I roll them up. I catalog them and then it goes into what I call the archives, which is one of three storage units. Also, I have a flat file. So um, I go through stages where I'm drawing and watercoloring and you, you can get a lot of works on paper that build up fast. And I can see, let's see where we'll pull out. This is a, a work on paper that I did down in Florida. This, this summer I was down there for about three months and I just watercolored the whole time because I don't have a painting studio. So when I'm traveling, I go to watercolor or drawing and uh, maybe there'll be times where I don't do anything for six months 
and then all of a sudden I'll be doing lots of them. And, and then I throw them in this flat file and that keeps organized. And when that flat file gets orange, uh, that might be of interest to some of you artists that are painters out there that are running out of room. Uh, there's no shame in having a storage unit. I, long ago, I had to realize that. I just keep a few tools here. Uh, a lot of today, a lot of shipping. Uh, in where I am in my career, I ship out a lot of stuff. Uh, so I, I try to make it as simple as possible. I keep my bubble wrap and everything right here. It's sort of the modern day shipping. Uh, then this on this rack, I keep my painting supplies. We've got acrylic in back. I use acrylic uh, aluminum foil for my uh, palette and then oil paints are in the front. I usually go with Utrecht, but lately I've been trying another brand uh, product placement here. Let's see, it's called Williamsburg. And I had a studio in Williamsburg at one time, so I I've, I've started using their paints. They, they hand make their paints. So. Anyway, there's no, uh, I'm not getting any benefit for saying all that. I'm just talking about my studio and where I am. Uh, this is my array of brushes. I like to have a good selection. Although when I'm painting, I might only use one or two brushes. I just keep working with the same brush and it's, uh, I just move real fast. I like to. And then uh, back here is Damar varnish. I make my own Damar varnish. Uh, I've been doing that for years now because of uh, what I like to have. Uh, a lot of drawing. I use a lot of oil crayons and Sharpies. Okay, let's move on. I, I have some vacant space right here, and that's going to become uh, bookshelves. I'm working on that. Over here, I have uh, uh, my music studio part. And about six years ago, I've always had an interest in playing fiddle playing, and I've loved it. Uh, but once I started painting, uh, painting took over my life. And I just spent all the time for probably 25 years. And then um, six years or so ago, I decided to go back and, and take the study of the violin. Now I call it a violin. Uh, serious. And I've been doing some collaborative work. I did a uh, slideshow with uh, Joe Craven with, with him playing violin and me painting. Uh, that was several years ago. Most recently, I'm, I'm playing and then doing a video and I put those up on my website. Um, and then uh, part of this part of my studio where I do my music, is I came across this poster, and I think it's kind of interesting to have in your studio, is this picture, this is part of a, a, a lithograph of a, a, a jazz album cover for Thelonious Monk, and it was done by uh, de Kooning. And if you look at it, uh, you can see this is de Kooning. He did this image, and it says rainbow, uh, you can see the bow real good up there's a uh, rainbow and then in the litho part of it is de Kooning had this sign but mine has his actual signature in pencil right there so that's a fun poster that I like having in my studio and it kind of reminds me about the the confluence of abstract painting or painting and music there's an older landscape that I keep around I keep looking at that uh, I have curtains so I can close my studio up and have it dark so I can uh, work on, uh, I do a lot of projection work. And we'll go over here. I'll set our, our operation down, making a few adjustments for you so that you can kind of see where I'm going now. Uh, this is a piece that I'm working on. Uh, this is the underpainting and I I got this done a couple days ago and I decided to leave it until after the studio before I go on but uh, because it kind of demonstrates on each side of it 
are finished paintings that are drying now. They take uh, three or four days to dry. Uh, but this one, if you can, if I can, I don't know how much you're gonna pick up, but uh, it shows the underpainting where I'm using, I'm using crayon and then I use acrylic paint. I'm projecting this, a projector of a uh, image that uh, Warhol got from China, <laughs> pretty famous. And that's how my work starts. I do a coat of epoxy, a thin wash of epoxy. And that makes this kind of surface that I like for oil painting. And I use an oil paint that's very heavy with Damar varnish in the paint. I don't do that afterwards. And, and when you paint along, let's see if I can move this studio light a little bit. And we can get a, this is, this is how it's finished. If you could see, you can see a little bit of an outline of a figure. That actually is an Andy Warhol image of Elvis. And Andy did a series called Double Elvis that uh, I like. So behind this painting, and I'm trying to get that glare out of, out of your way for you. Uh, behind this painting then is, a, a reproduction like like the Mao of a double Elvis. And this one I've painted over pretty extensively. You can see some of Elvis's foot in here. There's some of the drawing of his foot when I copy it. Uh, but that kind of gives an idea. This this is very representational of the work that I'm doing right now and my interest of of what I'm doing. The, the subjects of the Warhol, I painted over Andy Warhol, change quite a bit. And, and that's what I like about it. I've been painting them for 15, 16 years. There's over 500 of them. And the reason is, is because it seems like the subject is always interesting to me. Uh, and I, this latest subject that's just well, I think this is the first one. So I've only done two that are exclusively lotus plants. And here's, uh, here's another one I'll show you. And it's, uh, that's an image of Marilyn below it. Uh, you can see a lot more of the Marilyn, two lotus flowers over the top. So when I'm painting, I'm just trying to be spontaneous. I just paint the subject that I like and uh, the subject seems to interrelate with the Warhol image behind it to make a completed painting for me. And sometimes I only, I only need one image over the top. Sometimes I paint over all of it. It's very uh, fluid that way, which whatever's interesting me. Before, for the last three months, I've been painting spoonbills over uh, the Warhol. And now I've kind of moved on to these lotus plants. Uh, sometimes I think about combining the lotus and the spoonbill, but um, this is what I've been doing lately. And this is, this is my painting wall. A lot of uh, people will paint using, putting their paintings on stretcher bars or buying canvas with stretcher bars. But like I say, I go through a lot of paintings. I love painting. Uh, it's just something that I, I it, this is more economical. I can, I can pin up just straight canvas, paint on it, have fun of pushing paint around, letting it dry, then rolling it up, sticking it in the racks, and I can move on to the next painting. And, and that's what gives me joy. It's, that's the main reason painting. We talk a lot about the money and the, the prestige and all that of painting, but uh, uh, the real basic thing is that there's a there's a love of doing it that's greater than the love of marketing. Um, let's see, Janice, do we have time to talk about my palette a little bit, or how are we doing on time? Absolutely, we we have a good twenty minutes left, um, Mel. But I do have a few questions that have come in. If you want, sure, sure. Let me set this down a little bit. Just in terms of your studio, we have a question from Lynn who, she was wondering if you get frozen by changing studio locations. Do I, I get, 
a second. Do you get, do do you I get, get frozen? Yeah. How does your environment affect your work? And if you're oh, oh. changing of your oh, well, studio locations. Okay. Um, the, it, that's pretty exciting every time you change a studio. Uh, there, that's sort of a, there's two sides to that. It's exciting changing your studio. I mean, just walking around outside, it's different. You know, I can think about when I moved to, to Bushwick uh, in New York City. My gosh, I, I'd never lived in any place like that. So you could just walk around the block and come back excited. Uh, Rauschenberg talks about the Lower East Side and just the junk he was finding in vacant lots and on the street corner. So that had a big influence on, on him, his studio, and uh, the world of art today just because of that. So the same with me, probably anybody you move. Uh, this studio, because I'm on the water, uh, you might think that because of that, uh, I would be very much interested in painting and boats. <laughs> and in fact, I guess I am, but it's, it's a different reason. It's not that I, I look out at that, that uh, uh, the water and the mountains and go, oh, I want to paint. When I first started, though, when we looked at those early paintings, my gosh, uh, that's all I wanted to ever do. If I could just paint a landscape of Lake Tahoe or the Sacramento Valley, I mean, I just struggled with that for years and years to do it. Uh, then, that, then that studio location would really make a difference. But it's kind of like I've come full circle. So now I've got a studio in the mountains where, you know, when I lived in Davis, I, I had gotten in my car and would drive up before sunrise to the mountains just so I could see the sunrise in the mountains. Uh, so here I am now, every morning I see the sunrise in the mountains, but it's not my motivation today, you know, as far as that goes. But when I'm out on adventures, then I am influenced. And even though my latest subject is lotuses, uh, which I saw in that beautiful pond in Williamland Park in Sacramento, it was part of my adventures out away from the studio. So uh, my influence comes more from that than the actual studio location. That's great. Okay, yeah, and then we we do have interest in your palette. We're really, everybody's interested in what your palette um, is like and... Uh, okay, shall we take a look at it? Yeah, and how you prep your canvas before painting. And do you, do okay. you know how you get fumes from the Damar varnish? Oh, uh, yeah, 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 that's a biggie. Uh, and uh, the fumes, that issue, uh, which is part of artists, uh, professional artists, uh, that, that's a different, but I, I do use oil. We'll get to the fumes here in a minute. Uh, so I use oil and you'll see that I put out almost every color. I know that I'm not gonna be using purple on this. So I, uh, in this corner, I usually have purple but I don't have purple in this particular uh, palette because uh, I know on this painting, I'll be mixing my purple with, uh, I have red, I've got one, two, three, four, I have five reds, I have one, two, three, four, five blues. And if I get to purple, I'm gonna be mixing these blues and these reds to get what I want rather than out of a tube. Uh, my palette is, uh, I, I have a roll away which is nice because I can roll this baby all around the studio and it saves many, many trips. Since I lay out all my paint, you can see that would be at least 12 trips from, from here back over to there. And being a lazy painter that I am, uh, I have it on a roll away so I can roll over there. But I, I use aluminum foil for my palette covering and every painting when I finish, no matter how much paint is left, and some of this I won't even touch, uh, I throw it all away. So I throw away at least half of what I use. Uh, and then this is my medium here, 
which I, I have to label it so I don't, and it looks like it says Mel, but actually that's supposed to say medium. And then this is my turpentine. I use these two when I'm painting. And my medium is a, a mix of Damar varnish, linseed oil, and dryer, just those three things. But I mix them up about 50-50. And then turp, I'm cleaning my brush constantly. I'm constantly, like I, I, I use, probably just use like the, with this painting, I'm gonna start out and I'll walk over here, show you. I'll probably use a brush. Let's see if I can get this size of a brush for most of this painting. And if I go down to something small, this will be as small as I get on that painting. So when I'm, I'm painting along, I clean my brush constantly and I do it by dipping it into the turpentine, wiping it off on this, and then mixing the new colors that I want. It does stink. It's pretty smelly. And some, and talking about studios, some studios you can't even get into today by using these, uh, this turpentine that I use, raw turpentine, raw gum turpentine. Uh, and that's an issue, it's been an issue since uh, I was in grad school. Uh, I, I've tried switching to uh, terpenol, different, different things that are uh, less smelly. I'm not sure about how dangerous they are. They say they're dangerous too, but I just can't get away from oil paint. When I'm, when I'm painting here, and I'll go back over, the richness that I'm looking with the colors, I mean, I love color, so, to get this color that I'm getting here and the way, and to get that luminosity that I'm trying to get, uh, it's a formula that I'm used to and I like it and I know it's gonna go that way. So every time I've tried going to water base, it doesn't work out. I do do water base, like I say, when I'm, I'm uh, water coloring. And, uh, but when I'm here in the studio, Start out and and this one is it's all uh, fumes involved. Until I go to this, you can see that reflective shiny layer that's over all that. That's a very thin coat of watery epoxy. Now, in the Renaissance, they would have used rabbit glue, uh, and, but today I use epoxy. And that, that's something that I started doing in grad school. I, I, don't, I don't see any use for my work with a thick epoxy pour over that, uh, that you'll see a lot of artists doing. I try and keep it very subtle, keep it in the background. But then when I put my oil paint on top of it, I think I get a glow and a luminosity uh, and it's a very important part of my process is, is that beginning of the painting. What do you think? So we talk about that some more or you think we got it there, Janice? I think it's great. Um, what about prepping your canvas? Did you talk about that? No, I didn't. Um, I, well, I've, I've just touched on it. Let's see. Uh, I buy my canvas in a roll and I'll pull this out a little bit. Ugh. So you can see it, but it's, it's, it, I buy it in a roll and we'll get the light. Uh, and it's already, it already has, uh, it's already got a coating of uh, undercoating on it already. I, uh, I used to do all this myself and, and I skipped this. But at one time, and probably when I had less money, uh, buy raw canvas, and I'd put my own gesso on it all the time. It's been maybe, like I say, the last 10 years, things have changed a little bit. So uh, the last 10 years, I buy gesso canvas, and I buy it in that roll like that. Okay. Then after that, then that's, that's when I project. I use a projector. Uh -huh. I'll project this image and draw it with crayon. 
fill it in with some acrylic paint. Let all that dry, do a wash over the whole thing of an acrylic paint wash so that there's no bare canvas that you can see. There's paint on every bit of it. And then that's how I prep my canvas. So this is part of, the, this is what I would call my prep. I coat it with the epoxy and now I'm ready to paint. So I don't really, even though that's fun, this is up to this point, it's sort of like the blue collar workman uh, job uh, where I, I just don't think of the artistic creative side. I just say, okay, I'm getting this canvas ready. And this takes me a day and overnight the epoxy will set up and then I'm ready to have fun the next day and put the push paint around. Great, are you gonna push some paint around? It's sticky. You, you've, got, you've got time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are, we are ready here. Um, and I'm, I need to make a quick adjustment. Two ups against that I'm going to do. And I know I've got something in mind because I've been working with the Lotus file. Now, Janice, when I look at my screen, it doesn't look like you could see. Is there white enough? Could you see? Yeah, I can see two of your paintings, or now I can see three. Uh, or I, I can see the okay. one, and then your lotus okay. on Maryland on the left. Yeah. Okay, so we'll we'll make this interesting. You could probably go up a little bit. They, you know, to show okay. the tops of them a little more. Okay. With your yeah, there you go. What I'm what I'm trying to do is show the palette with it down there. Oh, I see. I understand. Well, okay. Yeah. That's, let's let's that's, go with that and see what that's, says. Okay, then let me know. Okay, so I put on a painting apron. That's what I do. I know some of the more famous uh, artists use a uh, a Gucci suit. <laughs> um, I've tried finding a suit in the secondhand stores in uh, New York, but uh so i come in i always have my rag here and i've got my medium it's i mixed it up last night and i just get, get my brush in there so i'm not like just patting my brush in i'm in there really gooping it on the brush and almost always i'm into white at this point and i'm I don't think you can see that, but anyway, I'm putting in lots of white and just a tad of red. I'm trying not to sound like Bob Ross either. <laughs> and I know I'm going to do lotus flowers, so. I really admire Bob Ross. He, uh, I, I was led into painting, that painting was okay because my mom was a Sunday painter. She always hoped that she could get in the plastic art show, the annual, and she painted landscapes and she never made it. Uh, so the, the time I got into the Placerville uh, show, it was a lot of fun for her to go. And, and the, the judge who I knew, I didn't know anybody in the art world was Gregory Condos. And uh, I don't know if Greg remembers this, but he gave me first place too. It was a big deal for me. So I'm just gonna, I know that the Lotus, this is how I do it. I'm making big brush strokes. I'm staying away from small stuff. I'm gonna lay this thing out. Uh, I've, I've been drawing Lotus plants, so I know kind of how they are. are. And, I, and I want to, I want to remember, and also I'm going into some orange now. I want to remember that I'm painting and I'm not drawing. So I'm keeping these brush strokes, a lot of confidence in them. And, uh, and everything that I'm doing and saying, I'm pretty well have learned from some very good painters. Uh, 
from, from watching Bob Ross with my mom to uh, uh, Wayne Tebow, you know, uh, seeing how they go about it. And it takes, uh, as a student, I would come up to see somebody's painting and go, oh my gosh, how could they ever do that? But after you paint for a while, you just get that brush real sticky and gooey, and it's a lot of fun. You can go and make colors. And I make colors until I see something happening. And pretty soon I'm gonna see that this thing, if, if I stay with my color wheel, this thing is gonna jump out. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for those colors to pop. And I'll keep painting until it does that. And I'm adding a little darker. And I'm not worrying about these drips at all. I'm just starting to look and, and if I, and I, I don't know if you can tell, I'm squinting my eyes. So if I get back and squint, that helps me see it jump. And once, once the painting starts jumping, then I'm real happy. And I'm using tons of DeMar varnish and just pouring it on this thing. And, uh, and this, I can do this for two or three hours at a time. And then I'll run out of ideas. So right now I'm excited. Everybody's in my studio watching me. So this energy level will stay going for a couple hours. But then once it goes, I have to quit. Otherwise, I'm just pretending. I'm just sort of going along without really engaging in this visual act. Uh, then it becomes like drawing or we could talk about photography or anything like that. But painting in that getting something that that pops that becomes greater than the paint uh, i can only do that for a couple hours so that's what i would be doing on this particular lotus and and i gotta remember lotus have stems uh, on that other one i forgot that lotus had stems so pretty soon i was painting like uh, uh lily pads which were okay that's just terrific but I'm looking at lights and darks. I'm looking for harmonic, harmonic colors. And, and uh, well, how do you use the color wheel uh, relationship with this painting? What do you? Well, the color wheel, and and I've had people even when I had my studio in New York, you know, and, and there was a lot of really good artists would come through that studio, and they go, "Why do you still have a color wheel?" And it's when. Like I say, when I'm painting long, I'm looking for something to happen. Sometimes it doesn't happen. And I have to sit back. And if I have my color wheel, it's like a reference book. I can go back, I'll reference my color wheel, and, and always the, I go, oh yeah, I pushed, I pushed the blue. So like right now, we have a blue background. The acrylic background is blue. So I'm painting up here. So this would be your primary color. And then these are your harmony colors up here. As long as I stay in that color wheel, I got a good chance. Mm -hmm. Now, I can, I can venture over to this little window here and this window here. Those are, be careful, be careful. You might get a little of that color in, but be careful. So that's how I use my color wheel. Is it, it's kind of, it gives me, when I get, when I lose it and I forget, it gets me back on track. And even painting 30 years or so that I've been painting, that guy will still save me. Maybe every two or three paintings, who knows? But if I get too, if I get lost, that's how I get back. So I always pin it up there. Um. Okay, and uh, we've got about 10 more minutes. So if oh, folks have been asking a few questions, but you had talked to me a little bit about tech secrets and how you don't believe in, in keeping secrets. <laughs> that well, no, yeah, and, and I think, uh, right now I'm cleaning my brush with the turpentine uh, just to get ready for another color, but we'll answer this question. One thing is that uh, if, and I'll move this back around for us and do a swap. So 
one thing about, um, uh, and I started to talk about education. This is, to me, that's what the value of the education was. I, 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 since I went through that process and I started out thinking I didn't really need to get educated, that painting is just something you can do. You know, everybody can do it. That's what, that was my, my thinking. But the more and more I got involved, the more I realized it was much greater than I ever thought it was. And it, I, it left behind the marketing or making money with painting or anything. That, that painting is really something that you do. And it's like a lifetime thing. So the way I learned painting was to get in front of professors that knew how to paint. And of course, art history. And a couple times people had said to me, if, and, and we're talking about growing with painting, that if you look at somebody that hasn't gone on, they, maybe they paint in a great landscape, but they, that's all they do the rest of their life, which is great for them, but they might be protecting something, that they're, they're, they've got a little secret and they're afraid to share it. And that really hit home with me. I really agree that, that when I have something that I don't want anybody to know about, I start protecting it. And in that, in that effort of my brain protecting something, I don't want somebody to steal something from me, then I realize I'm no longer venturing out to look at new things. Or if I look at new things, I think I'm stealing them kind of thing. But really painting's all about learning. It's lifelong learning. And I found that if, if I'm hiding something, afraid to say it, then I've cut myself short on this, the bigger picture, which is the lifelong learning. And it seems to work. That's why it's great inviting people in. I, get, I can say everything. And also, I've also found a secret that I share with you. You could take it, you could follow me and do as, as if it was written out, and you would still do it different. Because our creativity, you know, each of us is different. So even if I followed uh, uh, Bischoff, Elmer Bischoff, uh, that early hero, to almost to, to every stroke, it, it's still painting is something that comes from really deep down and is very genuine. And I would still come out, it would still be my own. So there's a lot of times when people are maybe thinking they're stealing secrets from their, they're copying someone and, and really everybody around him goes, yeah, he's copying. And I did the same thing, but eventually your own abilities come through. And that's, that's worth a lot more than any secret, at least in my book and, and my philosophy of painting, it's worth uh, any secret that I could have harbored and hid thinking that was so valuable. A great example, a great example is the artists that uh, started using photography in the 1400s. And not only did they not want their friends to know they were doing that, but also they could be sent to the guillotine for using cameras, reproduction ways. So there was a you know 200 year span that people couldn't talk about a camera. And then when we get into sort of the modern history, the, the French Impressionists, they just hid the fact they were using cameras and um, they jealously guarded it. And you see, we've moved on. We've moved on from them. Uh, so there's one, one giant secret that artists harbored that we can look back to. And, and you're very glad you freed yourself from the camera. You know, you're very glad that you can project, and Warhol did that too. You know, he just said, look, I'm going to take a picture of you. I'll just reproduce it, but I'll do it in my own way. And then, you know, he had the, all these famous portraits that he did. Uh, but that was because the secret of the camera got out. Great. Today, you don't, you don't see too many people harboring that secret, but there's secrets like that. And the epoxy too. A lot of people think using epoxy is a secret, but it's just a modern material that we use. Mm -hmm. That's well. Actually, there was one technical question. Somebody did want to know what kind of projector. <laughs> oh, oh, now that's a good question too. What? <laughs> so 
What happened? What happened to Mel? Uh oh. Can't Mute. Oh, there you go. How about now? That's okay. Yeah. When I was uh, when I was teaching uh, at the at the rec center, I would teach drawing and figure painting and all. I I would put people on a fast track of learning how to draw, and I'd pull out the projector, and it would like, oh no, we have to learn how to. Well, yeah, you do have to learn how to use it by your hand, but this projector is a great tool. Um, we but have minutes. we have five minutes, Mel. Okay, so I spent a lot of money on projectors, and I actually have my my favorite projector costs over a thousand dollars, and it's sitting in a storage unit in New York City waiting for me to get back. So right now, this is my projector. It's a couple hundred dollars. I got it used. It's from 3M. And, and uh, I, I dislike it, but I've learned to love it because I haven't been back to New York uh, to my studio for a couple of years. And so this is the projector I use. Anything that gets it, you're, all you're doing is putting the lines up and you're going on from that. And you can see I don't use a projector for when I'm painting like my subject because I want it to flow. A projector keeps you in the lines. And, and since I'm using Andy Warhol and copying, it's important for me to keep in those lines on that underpainting. Good question. <laughs> I love talking about my projector. <laughs> okay, we and I had another question from someone who said, um, do you think it's a good idea to have gallery representation? Oh my gosh, you know. And we have three, uh, minutes, three minutes. Oh, well, let me know. Uh, that's, that, it's, that is so important for artists today, especially if you're going, you know that your ambition or your desire to paint, you just love it. It comes deep down. You know, you want to keep it painting and you want people to see your work. Uh, and, and I, when I was coming up, uh, through education, I was meeting these professors that were successful with galleries and not only regionally, like in Sacramento, uh, but like Tebow, who was international and nationally known, uh, Oliver Jackson, uh, they were heroes and I wanted, I wanted to be able to follow in their footsteps, but the gallery scene was changing and it, it changed in the eighties, just as I was coming in. Uh, I was very lucky to have a gallery uh, give me a summer show uh, in the early 90s, which motivated me tremendously to, have, to show in New York. But I really didn't know what I was doing. And at that time, you took slides and you walked around to all these galleries. These galleries would see you as a product that they could market. It was You could understand the system. But today, you know, the social media, uh, if you can get a gallery, uh, that's terrific. Um, just because you're in a gallery doesn't mean you're really an accomplished painter. It's really more, it's more of a marketing. It's more of fitting into a marketing scene more than a painting scene. Uh, there's a few galleries that are very much interested in the painting, but these guys, I mean, some galleries, it's a hundred thousand a month rent. And, um, they've got to be able to pay that and they they've got to go with somebody that they can sell to the the biggest market so that's a complete different side of painting uh it the 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 only transition is that as a painter you want people to see your work but what you do on that other side it, it's it's just such a different side of it but yeah if you can get representation and it all depends on your gallery how motivated they are you know what they're if they love to see you as a painter or they love to see you as a product. If, if you're a painter, but they see you as a product, you've got to live with it because you don't have much of a choice. Mel, you know, you but so in galleries, definitely. This was fantastic. I, we, we, I learned, we learned so much. It was just so fascinating to get a glimpse of your process in your studio. So thank you so much for sharing today.